Welcome back to Blaze Capital. My name is Justin, and today we have an exciting company to talk about, one that I am a shareholder in. So it's not often that I'm doing a CEO interview where I've actually purchased some stock. So today I have Ali with me. He is the CEO of Wishpond. And uh, hey, Ali, how are you? Good. Thank you very much. I had a fun time talking with you before we started recording. And what I was looking at to get through the, uh, the interview here is that, again, I purchased a little bit of stock. I don't have a huge amount, but after going through and doing the company profile, I liked what I saw. And I was excited to do this interview with you. And uh, I'm hoping that after this interview is done, I'm going to find a reason to buy more stock. Because for me personally, it has been difficult to find Canadian success stories. And when I went through your deck, what I realized is that a lot of what they have here, people just don't know they need it. So they need this. They just don't know it exists. And because I'm usually uh, more technically savvy, I'm able to identify trends ahead of time for my own personal business. As I was going through your deck, I'm like, yep, I need this. I need that. And it just clicked for me. It made perfect sense. So yeah, exactly. as we're getting started here, uh, sorry, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. I was just going to say, I'm excited. I'm not often excited to do these interviews. So as we're getting started here, maybe you could just tell me, there's a lot of marketing companies out there. What makes Wishpond unique? So I think if you think about it in terms of what we do, our, our focus is small businesses for most part. And then, you know, if you think about the small businesses, they have limited financial resources and also they don't have the marketing know-how. They're focused on running their own business. So they can either go to a marketing agency and pay, you know, four or five, six thousand dollars per month and plus ad spend. And that's cost prohibitive for your uh, average small business. So that's not really realistically an option that they would explore uh, majority of them. Or the other option they have is to use one of the thousands of marketing technology tools that are out there. And then vast majority of them, as I'm sure you're aware operating their own silos. So now you have to figure out how they work together. What do you need for what part? And, and do I have a designer to actually do a high quality work on some of these things? Do I have a developer to gel it together? And if you're not a marketing professional, you will still pay for those subscriptions and not get return on investment. So mm -hmm. with Wishbone, really what you get, which is unique, is it's an all-in-one platform. We provide all the tools that they need to succeed online with customer acquisition and generating leads in one single platform. We also give them marketing services help, so expert help with an account manager who has access to designers and copywriters and you know all of those things so that they have best chance of success. And they pay you know one tenth of the price that they would pay. You know, if, if they had to pay five thousand dollars to an agency, now they pay five hundred dollars, they get all the platform plus the services that they need to succeed. So mm -hmm. that, that is quite unique. Uh, and we do all of that still while retaining 65, 70% margins. And that's what impressed me too, is that again, I think that like any digital service that has a very high gross margin and growth potential is very exciting. So I'm just thinking out loud here, if you could think of another publicly listed company that is similar to Wishpond, who would you say that is and why? Yeah, I can answer that in a number of ways, but I think the, the first name that comes to my mind is the early days of Shopify. So there are certain parallels between Wishbone and Shopify. Shopify is focused on small businesses and entrepreneurs, and that's the, the, the market that we serve as well, that we feel is underserved, similar to you know, the, the problem that Shopify is, uh, is solving for them. And the natural question that Shopify is the answer to is, who do I need to use for building my business online, right? And with Wishbone, the nat we are the natural answer to who do I need to use if I have an online business and I want to promote it and I want to get customers online, right? And except we're very early on and we're not that you know well known, and but but that's I think what what is so exciting about this opportunity ahead of us. And I wasn't planning on saying this, but uh, it's just coming to my mind right now. So someone who I used to build websites, so I, I used to be a web designer. I used to build on something called WordPress, and I would use mm -hmm. things like WooCommerce. That was a great business when everything was fragmented, meaning that me as the person who was selling the products, it was good that everything was fragmented because if they wanted to have a product to sell online, there was not an easy solution out of the box to do everything. You had to use like a, a platform to build it, like a CMS, like a WordPress became very popular. Then you have to choose how you're going to collect the payments, PayPal or through WooCommerce, and then you have a store. But if something and breaks... Then, yeah. Pretty and much. then you need someone for email marketing, and then you need someone for your CRM system, and then you need someone for if you want lead capture forms or pop-ups or those kind of things. Uh, it, it becomes a bit of a mess if you want to do proper marketing, which I think is the key, right? Because when you go online, it's a level playing field. 
small business can act like a large business, except the large business really is using best of breed in you know, tools and expert help. And if the small business is just doing small part as opposed to you know, using the proper tools and the strategies and doing it high quality, they're not going to be able to compete. And that means that every dollar they spend, they're going to get 80 cents back as opposed to having mm-hmm. return on investment. What I was what I was going to finish off too and say is that uh, so the website is built, but now we have to go sell it. So you have all the startup capital just to start selling, and then you have to figure out what am I now going to figure out after. So I think that the reason why this is not quite as popular is because yet is because people are still just figuring out how to build things. What I also realize is that when Shopify existed, it was just easier for me to say that I'm going to charge you less to build your website. We're just going to build it on Shopify. Out of the gate, it's less time commitment for me because it's hard for me to sell my service when. Uh, it's just easier to go to Shopify. And I think that as more people become familiar and aware of your services, they're going to start using them more. They might use, mm-hmm. like the easiest way to think of it is like, they're all coming into, you you're like, have like a, Wishpond has like a central area where everything can plug into. And right now there's a lot of data, but it's not very smart. At least for me, as I'm running my business, I have to take all that data, compile it, and then put it into a report myself. I do that manually right now. What I think what Wishpond is able to provide is out of the box, just like Shopify, an experience for the average user for the desired effect of selling. And that, that's, what I, that's what I saw. That's right. That's right. Um, that's right. And you're building an ecosystem where, again, like you said, like with Shopify, you're planning on selling, go set up Shopify. It's the simplest, easiest way. Is it the best? Is it the most customizable? No. But for the average user or the biggest market, that's where it's going to be. And I think that, right. like, what, what do you think about that? Like, do you see yourself in that same way or do you see, any, see yourself in different ways, which one? No, I, I think you're absolutely correct. And, and because of that, we actually have a lot of customers who are using Shopify for building their online storefront. And then they use us for getting customers. It's, mm. it's, you know, we have a very tight integration with Shopify Marketplace and Shopify, you know, all the events and attributes and everything that's happening on Shopify is feeding back to us. There's revenue attribution, there's, product recommendations, all of those shopping cart abandonment that can be automated. So, so there's, there's a lot of those. And I think that that is quite exciting. And that's, that's a gap that exists in the market that we serve quite well. Yes. Yeah, so having the report is one thing, utilizing it to make money or to get uh, more conversion is something else. And I, I really like that. So if we're thinking about uh, Wishpond now becoming a public company in December of 2020, why did you decide to list now? And uh, like, why did you go public? Yeah, good question. So that was actually a question that we thought about for a long time. You know, as the founder of the company, obviously, it's, it's not a light decision, decision to make. But we wanted to have growth capital available to us. And as you know, a company who wants growth capital to actually take the company to the next stage and really scale it, having proven a lot of different levers for growth, we could have either sold to a larger player, which we didn't want to do because we see a lot of potential, or raise money from a VC or go to the capital markets and you know, raise that way. Public markets was a lot more interesting to us because it also allows us to use our stock as a currency for acquisitions as well. Acquisitions was an important part of our strategy going forward for growth, for, for growing faster than our uh, historic 30, uh, 35, 40%. That, that is still impressive, but you know, we felt we can actually do better than that if acquisition is, a, is an important part of what we're doing. And public markets really support that well. And what I've been noticing is that, again, so it looks like you have, uh, there's probably been some things on your plate for a while, meaning deals you've been looking at, because again, since you've been public, there's been two acquisitions this year, Invigno Media and then Persist IQ. So could you, could you tell us a little bit about those two acquisitions and how they created shareholder value? Yeah, for sure. So uh, Invigo, which was the first acquisition we made, is a marketing technology and services company that focuses on healthcare market. So serving clinics and so forth. And it, it's, it has been very exciting to us for two reasons. One is that it allows us to get into the healthcare market serving you know, medical clinics that we didn't have any foothold in, right? And it's not easy to get into it if you don't have the domain expertise for it. And the second is that over the years, they have developed a very complete platform called Evergenius that has CRM functionality, appointment booking functionality, call tracking, social media management, a lot of different things that were quite complementary to what we do. And already we've announced the integration of the appointment booking feature of Invigo through Evergenius into Wishbone and made it available to all, all of our clients. So for those two reasons, it has been very interesting to us. 
The second acquisition we made was with Persist IQ, which is a Bay Area sales automation platform that B2B companies uh, who have sales teams. And Persist IQ also is one that has been near and dear to our heart because over the years, our sales team actually has used them for sending sales emails and you know, serving 800 clients. And it was just fortunate enough for us that the founders created a bit of a spinoff in mm-hmm. a company that gets into more of the Salesforce market and uh, you know, e- making, making that experience easier. And they raised money for that. So we found an opportunity to get in and say, well, you know, this, is, this is a great gem. We would love to own it. Mm-hmm. And that worked out well that way. I think any other circumstances would have been probably hard for us to get in. Mm-hmm. And that one also we put in a new management is, is growing really well and adding a lot of value to Wishpond. I, I think fundamentally in both of those acquisitions as well as the future acquisitions, it's about two things, adding synergies to Wishpond. So there's cross-sell opportunities, there's features that would take us longer to develop on our own that is added. It's revenue that already is accretive that we can add. And also now we have more bullets that we can use for growth, right? Like now we can grow mm-hmm. Imbigo, we can grow uh, Persis IQ to uh, grow alongside the core of uh, Wish One as well. And like, I think that like from a fundamental perspective as well, like what I've been noticing is like through your financial statements that it looks like these acquisitions have been accretive. So yeah. you mentioned that one of the reasons why you want to go public is to do more acquisitions. So with that in mind, are you looking to make more acquisitions this year? If so, like what kind of companies would you be looking at? Yeah. So in terms of them being accredited, for example, profit margins have remained the same after the acquisition. So, you know, we have a very good handle over that. The other thing also is that, you know, in the past we've grown 35, you know, to 40% year over year, just first quarter of this year that we've already announced that has the two acquisitions mostly in there. We grew by about 74% year over year to the year before. So, that, and, and some of that is organic growth, but a lot of it also is in, in new acquisitions that we made. So you can already see that it's accelerating our growth. Last year, we ended the year at about 7.9 million. This year, analyst forecast is hitting uh, more than $14 million of revenue. So 75% growth this year. And that is just with the two acquisitions we made on our organic growth. Um, and doesn't take into account that for the remainder of the year, if you have two more acquisitions, we would found, uh, find that a very positive outcome. And that's, you know, that's what we're hoping to do. So they w- the acquisitions would likely look similar to companies you've acquired this year, like Invigo and uh, like Persist IQ, where they, they would be accretive to the company. And uh, we have to assume that, again, if you're using a stock as currency, you want that to be worth more tomorrow than what you paid for it today. So Yeah, make- yeah, for, for sure. For sure. And uh, most likely they will be more in the marketing technology area, similar to Amigo mm-hmm. Virginius and Persis IQ. And obviously we look at things very, I would say with a disciplined mind. So we, we want those that we're acquiring them at a lower multiple than we ourselves are trading, which is immediately accredited to the investors. We mm-hmm. also want to acquire them with a combination of share stock and future earn out that again, you know, the money that we have can go further and build more, more value to the company. And I think, you know, one of the things that's actually quite key in this is that I'm the founder of the company. I'm not some hired CEO. And, you know, the insider ownership of which one is quite great, which means that I would be the last person who would want dilution for the sake of growing top line if it's not accredited to the company. I would only want more acquisitions if we get more value out of it than you know the the money we're using or the shares that we're giving for it. So what that means to me is that you're a good steward of capital because um, the person who has the most to benefit and the most to lose from having a good deal versus a bad deal is you. Yeah, um, and the hundred percent. And uh, you're still leading the company, which means that you've probably seen this grow to uh, an area where it's uh, it's exciting, but you want more. And I understand. I, it makes makes me uh, makes me understand a lot better what you're trying to say. So just as we're wrapping up here. Um, if we were thinking about the retail investor and someone who was looking at the stock versus other opportunities, what goals is Wishpond hoping to accomplish in the next 12 months? And why should investors consider buying Wish today and be excited for the future? Yeah. So if you think about it, you know, there are three analysts that are covering our stock and their target price for the stock is about $3 and the stock is trading at one fifty. dollars 
So immediately mm -hmm. you can look at that and say, okay, the 12 month horizon they're looking at for the end of 2021 is, you know, 100% uh, more than what it is right now. So, you know, what, what is the reason for that? The revenue is continuing to grow and that's what they expect. And, you know, this is, this is a company that has millions of potential customers out there in the small businesses, has a profitable and a scalable way of reaching those customers. And for the remainder of the year, we're hoping that, you know, we can have a couple more acquisitions as well. And those would be more catalysts that add, you know, fuel to the fire in terms of the, the, the company. And, you know, we're, our, our second quarter results are going to come out end of August. I think that's the time frame. And, and, and you know, we're, we're seeing continued growth as well. Obviously, I cannot say more, more about it than that. So, you know, this is, this is something that I myself within the past month bought more shares of Wishbone. I plan to do more of that as well. I'm very bullish about it. We recently actually announced uh, NCIB for those who might not be familiar with it is we put the program in place that if needed, the company itself can buy back shares from the market, realizing that, you know, at least at the current prices, we're probably undervalued and we want to have some safety net for the company as well as the shareholders who come in. Mm -hmm. So circling back to what I said at the beginning of the interview was that there's very few success companies out of Canada. I think that the analogy of looking at Shopify makes it very easy for the average viewer to understand the upside potential because you're not doing this for the first time. There's already been an established company that's been successful. I've also seen a lot of the fatal errors, which is why the YouTube audience enjoys watching this channel, I've seen those fatal errors in the Canadian companies. So honestly, this is one that I was quite excited to talk about. And I think that everything you've told me tells me that my investments are, uh, sorry, my investment is in good hands and I should be excited for the future. And uh, for our, uh, our, our audience out there, again, if you guys have enjoyed the content, I'd really appreciate a thumbs up. And we'll also, also include some links in the description to learn more about the company, uh, including, the, including the link to our previous video and to go watch their PowerPoint deck. So thank you, thank you again for watching and thank you for being here, Ali. We really, really appreciate your time and I look forward to hearing more about the company's updates. Thank you very much. And I appreciate having me. Thank you. Take care.